Before we get into today's stories, visit dreadsarmy.com to sign up for the Dread Weekly newsletter so you don't miss out on any updates. Also, check out all of the channels in the Dread Network on dreadsarmy.com or in the description below. Thanks for listening. Now let's get to the stories. I'm an F-16 pilot based at a military base in the southwestern part of the United States. And as you probably know, UAPs, otherwise known as Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, aren't exactly a new thing. I mean, they used to be called UFOs, and before that, they were called something else. We've basically been trying to find a name for them since we as humans could talk. None of the acronyms really do them justice, do they? Maybe that's because each title brings on a very specific image. UAPs remind us of obscure lights like the orbs over Arizona in 1997. UFOs remind us of the classic green men in a flying saucer. But that doesn't cover every variable. Those two sides of the Venn diagram don't encompass everything that we've seen. The sky is home to almost as many phenomena as the sea, and almost as many creatures. That's the UAP that I encountered. That's the one we were asked to identify, to follow, and to eliminate. Saying it made us nervous would be an understatement. One of the planes was being tailed by an unidentified aircraft. It started over the skies of Nevada and followed the plane east. It registered on radar and the pilot caught glimpses of something massive, diving above and below the clouds. The pilot described it as too mobile to eat any type of human craft. He couldn't make out the details through the density of the atmosphere, but he could tell that its movements were too agile to be man-made. There are protocols for that type of encounter. Believe it or not, they happen quite frequently. Most times, the danger posed by the mysterious craft quickly dissipates. We weren't that lucky this time. Then again, we weren't exactly dealing with an aircraft. Suddenly, the unidentified object increased its pace. It cut ahead of the plane and jumped below the clouds. For a split second, it was visible in its entirety to the pilot and to the recording instruments within the cockpit. The findings were unanimous. It wasn't an aircraft. It was alive. It was a creature of some kind, as large as a 747, structurally similar to an eagle except in the places where its feathers were missing and its leathery flesh was visible beneath. The turbulence caused by its erratic flight pattern was strong enough to throw the plane off course. They landed safely. That's when I was contacted. Myself and a group of pilots were sent up in F-16s to attempt a pursuit of the creature. We scoured the area, searched as thoroughly as we could, but returned to base empty-handed. All we had were the original readings and the pilot's description of what he saw. That was enough to keep us interested especially as other reports trickled in from civilians. Fortunately, the creature was always too far away to be vividly captured on film. We used those reports to track its flight path. We spent months trying to predict its behavior so that when it turned up, we'd be waiting. Whether or not the creature had any cruel intentions at heart is obviously up for debate, but its existence was enough of a threat to our security that something had to be done. At the time, I wasn't the type to ask a lot of questions. I liked having orders. Orders made things easy. Of course, we didn't expect that the beast would come for us. We woke up to alarms. Training and adrenaline filled in the gaps where fear would have left us vulnerable. The base was fully alert and capable of violently defending itself within minutes. We were expecting an airstrike. We were watching the gray skies overhead waiting for the clouds to explode. Our anti-aircraft operators were screaming with chatter, unsure of whether or not to act on what they were seeing. It took the rest of us a moment to catch on. We didn't know what it was until it was on top of us. Even the few there who had actively been pursuing the creature didn't expect to see it like this. It descended through the clouds and blacked out the sky behind it. It seemed to spread its wings from horizon to horizon, it was easy to imagine the giant bird spreading its giant maw and plucking us all from the ground. The anti-aircraft missiles kept that from happening. 
small explosions rippled against its body, sending shockwaves through its feathers and through the musculature below. It let out a screech that shattered every pane of glass on the base. Then it pulled upright and flew away. We wanted to run it down. Our own vehicles were suddenly inoperable. We were stuck there with no choice but to watch it depart, knowing that our best defenses had only tickled the great creature. It had come down and warned us, we decided, and no one wanted to chase it anymore after that. We were scolded by our superiors. Of course we were. Blaming us was the only action they could take. We took our lashings and moved on. The incident at the base was described to the press as a routine drill. The papers ran whatever story they wanted to, most often suggesting that we had tested some top secret weapon or vehicle. The sightings from around the base were easily explained away as weather phenomena. The creature was so big already that it was easy to imagine it was only a cloud painted alive by just the right balance of wind and moonlight. Before we could resume the hunt, we were relieved to learn that the beast had been brought down by someone else. An international ally had spotted it over the ocean and sent the beast to the depths below. That was a better place for it than the dirt of the American Southwest. And now we have new protocols. There are new words in our lexicon and new orders that get issued when a UAP exhibits specific patterns. When it's alive, for instance, we don't pursue. We can't risk inviting something like the bird back to our military bases. When it's alive, we run and get as far away as possible. It didn't take us long to realize that we are no match for that creature. So for now, our officially unofficial orders are to run for the hills. I was an officer for the Minneapolis Police Department. This happened in the summer of 2007, and it is, without a doubt, the strangest thing I've ever encountered in my entire life. It started with some odd reports. Strange sightings that most of my department was convinced that it was an elaborate joke. Towards the end of it, we just stopped taking down the reports when we would get calls about it. The first call was from a college student. She was studying at a university in the area and claimed to have seen a creature on the roof of one of the buildings. The call came in on a Friday night, and when I heard the word creature, I assumed that someone was pulling a prank. She described a feathered birdman with glowing red eyes. I was on the phone with her at the station, and some of the other officers started listening in when I asked her to describe the creature. I asked what the birdman was doing, and it took every ounce of self-restraint I had to keep from laughing. She said the Birdman was just standing there, staring at her. I asked if the Birdman was doing anything illegal, and the girl hung up. In hindsight, I was definitely being a smartass, but how was I supposed to believe any of that? A Birdman with glowing red eyes? I didn't think so. However, we got another call the next day. This time it was from a woman in her 40s, working the weekend shift at a mall department store. She closed up for the night and headed to her car in the parking lot, and there, standing under a lamppost, was the dark silhouette of a man with wings. And get this, he had glowing red eyes. I thought the other officers were pranking me. There was no way there was another call in about a menacing winged man. I told them nice try and went on with the rest of my day. But it didn't end there. Not by a long shot. Over the next two weeks, we had numerous calls about this creature. It was everywhere and nowhere all at once. Sometimes it was described as having red eyes, sometimes gold or amber. All the callers said it was about five and a half to six feet tall and had wings. Not a single person saw its face. Sometimes it was on a roof, sometimes it was just standing on the ground in the shadows. No one ever saw it fly anywhere. After about the sixth call, I started to look into this as much as I could. There wasn't a whole lot to go on and the whole thing became a joke in our department. There would be bets on if we would get a call about the creature that day. We had wondered if there was maybe some new hallucinogenic drug out there causing people to see this thing. The other theory floating around was that there was some guy dressing up as this creature and trying to scare people. That was the theory that made the most sense to me. But you'd think that with all the driving around, we all do at night. One of us would have seen it by now. 
When I couldn't find any other information, I did a quick Google search and tried to find something that matched the descriptions. There, I did find something interesting. The Mothman. Now, I didn't really believe in all that stuff, but the sketches I saw of it were just like the descriptions we had been getting. I continued my search trying to find some reason that these creatures were all of a sudden popping up when there had been no evidence of them here previously. I didn't find much, but I did read that sometimes they show up just before something bad is about to happen. I got a sinking feeling in my stomach. I'm not sure exactly why because like I said, I don't believe in this stuff but I couldn't shake the feeling. We continued to get in reports of this thing, but that was about it. It had never attacked anyone or shown signs of aggression. It was just there, and still, none of us had yet to see one. Of course, we would jokingly say we saw the Birdman at a traffic stop and things like that, but it was just such an absurd thing that it was impossible not to joke about. The reports came in by the dozens during the last week of July. The creature was in the road, it was on the roof of the bank, it was in an alleyway. There was just no end to it. The reports were so numerous that we were told to search for this thing on our patrols. My superiors were convinced that it was a person or a group of people playing an elaborate prank, which to be fair was a logical explanation. The following week, just after 6 p.m. on August 1st, the I-35 West Bridge over the Mississippi River collapsed. It was a sudden freak accident due to a fatal design flaw of the bridge. It was loaded with rush hour traffic at the time. It was bad. There were 13 total deaths, I believe, and about 150 injuries. I didn't put it together at the time, but after that, the sightings of the creature stopped altogether. I still can't say exactly what the creature was since I never saw it myself. I don't know if the thing was evil or it came as a warning. I don't think anyone really knows. I do know that if I ever hear a report of one again, I'm taking my family and leaving town immediately. It was 1997 and I was camping with my sister at Craig Lake State Park in northern Michigan, up on the UP. It was the middle of summer and unfortunately we're expecting a heat wave on the exact week of our trip. We had both taken off from work already, so we decided to go anyway and try to enjoy it. We planned to sleep in our hammocks and brought bug nets to hang above them. If you've never been to the Midwest, we have mosquitoes here that are just huge. We brought a tent too, as it looked like we might have a little rain in the middle of the week. But neither of us wanted to sleep in a tent when the nighttime temperature didn't look like it was going to get below 80. Our campsite was a hike and type of spot but it was only about four miles from the parking lot. We were both sweating buckets by the time we hauled all our gear to the site, and I wondered if we would be able to survive the week or if we would roast alive. Most of the week went fine. Very hot and a little miserable, but we didn't run into anything strange. When I hear people tell stories like this, and there's almost always something they missed in hindsight, but here, there was nothing out of the ordinary. Nothing at all. On the fifth day, it had begun to rain about halfway through the day. It started out as a little rain but got significantly worse as the day progressed. It was just starting to get bad as we returned from our morning hike, so we took down our hammocks and set up the tent. By dinner time, it was pouring. We obviously couldn't get a fire started so we cooked dinner in the vestibule on a little portable stove. The tent had started leaking about an hour or so later. And then the wind picked up. There was a pool of water on the floor of our tent when we decided we'd rather hike the four miles back to the car. We figured we could probably find a hotel room in town, and if not, at least we would be dry in the car. The trail to the parking lot was well marked, and we should have easily found our way back. The rain and wind were making it hard to see, so when we thought we saw the red taillights of another car, we headed straight for it. It looked exactly like taillights bright red and glowing in the distance. It looked maybe 60 or 70 feet away from where we were on the trail. The trail had gotten soupy from all the rain and it became difficult to tell if we were on it or not. We tried to use the light as a guide to follow back to the parking lot, but we ended up stepping directly into a swamp. 
The sudden change in footing surprised us both, and we fell forward into the mud. It was that sticky type of mud that holds you in. I don't think it was quicksand, but it was difficult to get out of. When we had climbed back onto the trail, we sat there on the ground staring at this light that appeared to be dead center in this swamp. My sister was worried it was a car that had driven off the road. But it wasn't sinking and we didn't hear anyone screaming for help. I didn't know what it was, but something felt off about the whole situation. If it was a car, it's not like we would be able to help them anyway. We barely got ourselves out of the mud. We continued on in the direction we hoped was the parking lot. We decided we would call the police about the possible stuck car when we got back to ours. The rain got heavier, if that was even possible, and this strange red light faded into the distance. Not more than 10 minutes later, we saw another light. Red, about three feet off the ground. Looked just like the taillight of a car. This time, it was in the middle of a forest. I recognized this area. We were almost to the parking lot, but this particular area was heavily wooded. No way would a car even fit between the trees in here. I said it can't be a car, that it must be a person with a red lantern or a red headlight. My sister called out to see if anyone needed help. No answer. My sister wanted to go in there and see what it was, but I definitely did not. But the longer I stared at the light, the more I wanted to investigate it too. I felt strange watching it, almost like I was in a trance. And then the light moved. It dropped to the ground. It was maybe one foot off the ground now. It came towards us, slithering like a snake through the trees, moving back and forth but coming closer as it did so. It was very strange and also very much like a reptile. I had an overwhelming sense of dread. My sister and I didn't need to say anything, we just ran. I looked back to see the red light following us, but it stopped when it got to the edge of the trail. I never figured out what it was. My sister didn't have any explanation for it either. We did call the non-emergency police line when we got back to our car and reported a car possibly stuck in the swamp, but her and I both knew that whatever was out there wasn't taillights from a car. But at the same time, we wanted to say something that would get the police out there to investigate. We never did hear anything further about what they might have found. And to be honest, I'm happy with that. I'm happy not knowing the truth about what was attached to those slithering lights. I never thought I'd be one of the people that had a close encounter. But here I am, joining the ranks of the believers... Once you've seen something with your own eyes, it doesn't matter anymore what other people say. My name is Donna and I live in Watkins Glen in upstate New York at the base of Seneca Lake. We have a lot of wilderness areas around here and we see our share of black bears and deer and even the occasional moose. I've lived here my whole life. This all started with my daughter, Amy, who's seven. She's our only child and she spends more time than she should indoors. When I was a kid, I remember my mom had a hard time getting me in through the door for supper. But I guess kids these days are different. Even though I restrict her screen time, she spends a lot of her afternoons just drawing pictures and coloring. I guess that's not so bad, but I think all children need to be outside, enjoying the fresh air, for at least a couple hours a day. There aren't any kids her age near our house. So that's part of the problem. Our closest neighbor is a half mile away. I remember it was a Wednesday afternoon when it all started. My husband likes to have chicken on Wednesdays. So I was mixing up a marinade for the chicken when Amy came into the kitchen. She wanted a snack. It was a couple hours till dinner, so I gave her an apple. She whined a little. She'd wanted chips, but like I told her, you don't always get what you want. Amy had been coloring in the living room. But now she was getting bored and right on the verge of cranky. I told her to put on her sneakers and go outside to play for a while. Fresh air is the best cure for a youngster's crankiness, in my opinion. I watched her for a minute through the kitchen window. Our backyard ends at a deep stretch of woods, but Amy knows not to go in them. So far, she'd always followed the rules. Plus, what kid isn't afraid to be alone in the woods? I saw she'd taken her apple with her and I almost went to the door to remind her to eat it all and not just throw it on the ground. 
She saw my husband do that once when he tried to see how far he could throw one. And you know how kids are, copying everything you do. I got busy preparing dinner then and didn't watch her too much. About 15 minutes later, Amy was back inside, heading for the fridge. I said, hey, now, what are you after? And she told me she needed another apple. What happened to the first one? Did you drop it? I asked her. She said no. She gave it to the hairy man. I about dropped the potato I was peeling and asked, what hairy man? I was over to the window in a flash, but there wasn't anybody in the yard. Amy told me the hairy man didn't have a name, and that's when I figured she'd imagined it. Probably she dropped the apple and didn't want to say. I know some people will think I should have been more worried, but we aren't near the city or any neighbors, and Amy is given to imaginary friends. I just let it go, told her no more snacks, go wash your hands for dinner. She did and then came back to color some more. It wasn't until after she was in bed that night and I was cleaning up her crayons and papers that I saw it, a drawing she'd made. I recognized the stick figure in a red shirt and blue shorts with braids as Amy, but the figure she'd drawn standing next to her was kind of a shock. It towered over her, all scribbled in brown crayon. It looked like an ape with a person's face. I showed it to my husband, but he just laughed and said, that kid sure got an imagination. I put it out of my mind until the next day when Amy went missing. She'd been right there in the backyard and I could see her through the window. The next minute she was gone. I ran outside, calling her name, but she didn't answer and I really started to get scared. I went into the woods behind the house and walked around, calling her and getting more panicked by the second. And then I heard her voice. I followed the sound and all of a sudden I spotted her, standing in a clearing. I couldn't believe my eyes. There was this giant creature, about six and a half feet tall, standing only ten feet away from my little girl. It had animal fur all over it and a bumpy face like a caveman. Its arms were really long, its hands hung almost down to its knees, and its back seemed hunched. It stood on two legs, but not up straight, if you know what I mean. I swear, it looked exactly like how people describe a Bigfoot monster. I screamed and ran forward. My baby was in danger. The thing turned and looked at me and made this sound like a loud grunt. Deep, but not really a growl. And then it just crashed through the woods away from Amy. Poor Amy was so panicked she fell on the ground and started to shake and cry. I ran over and scooped her up and ran back inside, checking her all over. No injuries, but I called the police and then my husband, right away. I was totally hysterical. Unfortunately, that's how they treated me, like a hysterical woman. They didn't believe it was Bigfoot, of course. I mean, I could hardly believe it, and I saw it. They checked the woods and saw no sign of anyone. They asked Amy questions, but didn't believe her when she told them about the hairy man who liked apples. My husband thinks it was a human, some sort of child predator. He was pretty worried, thinking Amy almost got kidnapped. He went out and bought a dog the next day to keep us alerted and safe. A German Shepherd. I know what I saw. It wasn't human. Even with a dog, I'm afraid to let Amy go outside now. But she's pretty content to just stay in and draw pictures. Lots of pictures of the hairy man. So that's my experience. I'm now a believer. I just hope it doesn't come back. I was volunteering as a camp counselor on a really nice lake in upstate New York. I loved camp when I was a kid, so I figured it would be nice to give back. Hanging out with the youth of today and seeing what they were all about seemed like a fun way to spend my summer before going back to university. Part of working at the camp is showing up early and getting everything ready for the campers. There's a lot to get ready. You must bring in all the supplies like food and first aid stuff. There are all kinds of activity stuff, sports equipment, you name it. A lot goes into providing for hundreds of kids over a summer. It was my job to get the water activity set up. There was a lot to do. I was sort of surprised they expected me to get it all done by myself. The van was full of bags and cones and netting, and a bunch of other stuff. I dragged bags of stuff to the lake and put everything in order. It took like 10 trips. 
The sun was setting and dusk was settling in. It was going to be dark soon. I thought it was time to hurry up and get this done with. I was pulling out all the rope for the boundaries when I noticed something in the water. I saw splashes and ripples. I figured it was fish playing around. It was a lake after all. I ignored it and got back to work. A few minutes later, I heard a big plunk, like someone threw a rock in the lake. The ripples were bigger this time and they spread along the surface of the water. I looked around to see if someone was messing with me. A practical joke played on the new counselor or something, but there was nobody around. The sun was behind the trees now and it was getting colder fast. The hairs on my arms were standing up. I looked out at the water again and it seemed almost black now. I realized the goosebumps on my arms weren't only because I was cold. I was feeling nervous being near the lake alone. I shook my head and told myself I was being ridiculous. And then I heard splashing again. I looked up startled. I saw something going underwater. I only caught it for a second and I wasn't sure if it was a big fish or something else. Then I saw it again pushing its head through the water. It sat there like an alligator. Just the top of its head was exposed. The head was long and slick but scaly. I rubbed my eyes literally not sure if I was hallucinating. But there it was, whatever it was. I didn't know what to do. I heard when you see a bear you're supposed to make a bunch of noise. Or maybe you're supposed to stay quiet and back away. I couldn't remember anything but I felt like it was a threat. The head was pointed straight at me. The head came up. First I saw the long head emerge. It was like a weird alien lizard, black and shiny and slimy. The eyes were the most horrifying part. Those shone like they had their own lights inside them. The thing rose out of the water and kept rising. It stood up on two legs and stared at me. It looked like the creature from the Black Lagoon, like I saw on TV when I was a kid but the head was long and freaky like a deformed alligator. Its arms were long and thin and on the end of each were horrifying, long claws. They were shiny and yellow. It looked at me and I swear to God I thought it was grinning. It had row after row of crooked, sharp teeth. Its right leg took one small step forward and my body took over. I threw the ropes I was holding and ran as fast as I could in the opposite direction of the lake. I tripped and flew forward and almost knocked the wind out of myself, but I got up and kept running. I hid behind stacks of kayaks we had for the campers. I caught my breath and snuck my head around the side to look back at the water. That thing still stood there. It wasn't moving. It just stood there. I thought about yelling for help, but I was afraid the only thing that would come running was that monster in the lake. I heard sloshing in the water. I waited another minute and took one more look. I kept praying it was my imagination, but no, it was there. It looked closer to the shore now. I had to run. I turned and took off again and headed toward the main lodge area. I hoped all the other counselors were there. While I sprinted as fast as I could, I turned over my shoulder to look back at the lake. The monster was lowering itself down. It was slow and methodical, staring at me the entire time. I kept running and when I turned to face where I was going, I saw a counselor ahead of me waving at me. I bent down to catch my breath. The counselor asked me what I was doing. I took a deep breath and took one more look back at the lake. It was completely still and flat. There was no sign of life at all. The counselor asked me again and asked me if I was okay. I told them I was fine, that I saw something in the lake. They asked me what. I couldn't tell them the truth. There was just no way. I was too afraid of sounding crazy. I just told them it was nothing, just some fish or something. They looked at me like I was a little crazy anyway. And that's why I'm sharing this story now. I need to know that there are other people who have seen something like this. I need to know I'm not alone.